Great. All right. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Ken. I'm a researcher at UC Berkeley. Today I'll be telling you about point wait, point, sorry, I can't even get the name right. These are points 1A supernovae. Uh, while 10 years ago this meant a, a very specific kind of progenitor scenario and a specific kind of explosion, these days it's sort of a, a catch-all moniker for uh, helium shell explosions on white dwarfs in which the helium burning produces radioactive isotopes and those radioactive isotopes can power a relatively faint and fast uh, rapidly evolving transient. Now, since I've already gotten a little bit of grief this morning about uh, the naming uh, of these uh, supernovae, I'd just like to point out this is not my idea. This wasn't even uh, my advisor Lars Bildson's idea at the time. Uh, this was the idea of Chris Stubbs, a professor at Harvard. And so this is a Harvard-approved name. And while we're, <laughs> while we're at this conference, I would appreciate it if no one uh, gave me any more guff about it. <laughs> OK, so how do you get helium onto white dwarfs and binary systems? There are two main uh, progenitor scenarios, very directly analogous to the type 1A case, where you have a non-degenerate scenario and a, uh, a double white dwarf scenario, okay, except in this case, these are helium-rich stars. And so in the non-degenerate case, you have two main sequence stars. Your more massive one goes up the, its AGB, becomes a carbon-oxygen white dwarf. And the less massive one can have its uh, evolution, sorry, the font isn't working up, but um, its evolution truncated after it starts core helium burning. So you have a common envelope, you're left with a carbon-oxygen white dwarf and a core helium-burning star, a non-degenerate helium-burning star, okay, that can then overflow its Roche lobe either due to the emission of gravitational waves, this orbit shrinks and it overflows its Roche lobe, or in, uh, if it's a higher mass helium-burning star, it can uh, undergo expansion as it starts to evolve, become a helium subgiant, in which case you get thermal timescale mass transfer. And these two scenarios are kind of different and I'll, I'll, I'll say how that matters. In the double white dwarf scenario, you again have uh, two, your two main sequence stars. You have a white dwarf and a main sequence binary. And if that then uh, gets truncated before helium burning starts, you're left with a helium core white dwarf as the donor. So a double, double white dwarf where the helium core is here and the carbon oxygen core is there. Uh, or alternatively, alter alternatively, you can truncate evolution after helium burning is done, in which case you're left with a low mass carbon oxygen white dwarf. Now, carbon oxygen is not helium, I know that, but all carbon oxygen white dwarfs have a helium layer on top after their birth. And in these cases, for a low mass carbon oxygen white dwarf, it's actually a sizable helium layer of order 0.01 solar masses or so. And so you still get the transfer of helium onto a carbon oxygen white dwarf. Okay, so you're starting to pile up helium. You know, once mass transfer starts, you're starting to pile up helium onto the surface of the white dwarf. What happens? Well, at some point, you generate a large enough layer of helium that you start uh, burning helium at the base of that layer. Okay, and burning starts, and you get convection, uh, very directly analogous to what's happening in AGB stars. Okay, but the difference here is that these shells are quite large. They can be quite large. So in the normal stellar evolution case, convection is almost always efficient, meaning that even though all the burning is happening in a thin layer, the uh, the, any thermal perturbations you might have can get carried away by the convective eddies very rapidly. Okay, so the turnover time in the convective zone is always much shorter than any sort of runaway time in the burning layer. It's the opposite case for larger helium shells, the kind of helium shells you get in these binary systems, where the convective shell is so large that the helium burning layer can easily run away. Can, uh, the burning time scales can be shorter than the convective turnover times, in which case you get the localized, uh, a localized runaway and the birth of some sort of explosive helium flame. Now, in the first scenario I mentioned, where you have a non-degenerate helium star, you actually get quite large ignition masses of order a few tenths of a solar mass. So this plot is showing the donor mass as a function of the accretion rate. Okay, and for this scenario, you get uh, accretion rates that are something like a few by 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year. Also shown on this plot are the uh, convective uh, ignition masses, the ignition mass of helium at the point when convection starts for those given accretion rates. And you get ignition masses that are, again, a few tenths of a solar mass. Okay, so these are relatively large helium shells in this scenario. So this was sort of the first um, scenario that was thought of in the 80s and 90s. When I was in grad school, we started working on the scenario with a double white dwarf donor, so, sorry, a white dwarf, don white dwarf donor and a double white dwarf binary. Actually, for reasons uh, I won't have time to get into, I actually don't think these systems exist anymore. So my, uh, my, my thinking on this has evolved. I don't think you get stable mass transferring uh, systems in double white dwarf binaries. Okay. So I've sort of killed off part of my uh, thesis, but that's okay, that's okay. Our thinking evolves. Uh, but in those scenarios, if that were to be the case where you did get stable mass transfer, these are much higher accretion rates. So this is a track here where you come into mass transfer contact at something like 10 to the minus six solar masses per year. 
And the resulting helium convective shells you get are uh, concomitantly qu qu smaller, and so there's something like a few thousandths of a solar mass up to a few, few hundredths. Now there is another scenario, again, with the helium, non-degenerate helium burning star, except this time it's more massive, it's overflowing its Roche lobe via expansion, so it's undergoing thermal timescale mass transfer. It's a much higher accretion rate than the, the previous slide, uh, that scenario. So in those scenarios, you come into mass transfer contact, again, at very high accretion rates, some 10 to the minus five solar masses, then minus six solar masses per year. And again, you get smaller convective shells at the, at the point when, um, uh, sorry, you get smaller shells at the point when convection starts. But they're still large enough such that uh, the burning can decouple from the rest of the convective zone. You get the birth of some sort of flame. Okay, so those were stable mass transfer systems. There are also the possibility of unstable mass transfer systems, things where the, uh, a double white dwarf binary, you're tidally disrupting the, the, the donor. And in 2010, uh, James Guichon and Enrico and collaborators had a paper where they pointed out that if you have the system during the lead up to the merger, this helium can actually detonate. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to say detonate. It can actually explode, so it can have some sort of flame. Um, and so if you have an unstable double white dwarf merger, you can also get the birth of some sort of helium flame. Okay. As I, I mentioned before, I actually think that all double white dwarf binaries merge, regardless of the mass ratio. Okay, I encourage you to check out this paper. I think it's an interesting uh, uh, claim uh, that seems to actually have been borne out in observations of, of double white dwarf systems. So for example, Warren Brown and the ELM survey uh, just pointed out that the long, uh, they, they basically seem to agree with that, that claim that all double white dwarf binaries end up merging. Okay, I should point out that uh, Wolfgang and I actually agree that this kind of system is a very nice type 1A supernova candidate. I actually think that they're responsible for the bulk of type 1As. Okay, but for, since this is a point 1A talk, this is just the helium shell without the core explosion, uh, I'd like to say that you don't have to detonate the core. You don't have to explode the core. You can actually get away without exploding the core if it's a low mass core or if it's an oxygen neon core. Okay, so there are still, even in these unstable merger models, there's still possibility, the possibility that you don't explode the core and you just have the helium shell explosion. Okay, so just to summarize this progenitor portion of the talk, uh, there are a few different ways you can get helium being accreted onto white dwarfs that result in some sort of explosion. Okay. Lead from unstable mergers to stable mergers that are, uh, sorry, stable mass accretion that's happening on different time scales. But in all these cases, you end up with convective helium burning shells or uh, violently, you know, turbulent helium burning shells that can lead to some sort of explosion. All right, all right so I, I was purposely avoiding the words deflagration and detonation because I wanted to spend some time on what I mean by these two to try to uh, draw the distinction. Actually, Wolfgang uh, talked about this a little bit yesterday. So I won't belabor the point too much. But deflagrations are subsonic flames. So these are surfaces that are converting fuel into ash, and they're moving slower than the speed of sound, uh, generally by thermal conduction. Okay. Uh, whereas detonations are supersonic. Okay. So they're moving faster than the speed of sound, and they're being propagated by shocks. And there are several uh, major differences between these two modes of burning. The, one of the most important is that because deflagrations are subsonic, the ash has time to expand the fuel before the deflagration gets there. Okay, so there's some sort of pre-expansion and fuel you know, gets pushed on by the hot ash from below before it gets burned. Okay, so there's sonic communication between the two. As a result, the fuel can get pushed to lower densities and uh, deflagrations can get quenched that way. So the burning in deflagrations is less complete than in the other case in, in supersonic detonations. Right, so you get less of the alpha chain burning, you don't burn all the way up to nickel all the time, and you leave a lot of unburnt helium as well. That's opposed to the case of supersonic detonations, where the fuel has no idea that there is a flame coming at it, because that flame is moving faster than communication can happen. So it's just sitting there, and all of a sudden it gets smacked by a detonation. Okay, and that means that there's no pre-expansion, and the burning in detonations tends to be much more complete, burning more towards the iron group elements. Okay, so what regime are we in? All right, so for the case of unstable mergers where it's very violent, um, it's happening on a very uh, dynamical time scale, even if a deflagration were to happen, detonations are still going to happen because the deflagration doesn't have time to get set up, really. So detonations tend to happen in unstable mergers. Okay? For the convectively driven case, it's almost, it basically has to be the case that you start a deflagration first. Okay? So the deflagration, the subsonic deflagration, it's easier to set off, it's going to start. The question is, does that deflagration become a detonation? Okay, so it's directly analogous to the case of the type 1A supernovae uh, calculations where people have debated a lot about this deflagration to detonation transition. Uh, 
turns out for helium burning, it's always in the case, sorry, for these convective shells, it's always in the case that you're in what's called the distributed burning regime. So this is a case where the turbulence in this convective shell at small scales is actually uh, more important than the actual propagation of a deflagration on its own. So if you do the naive calculation, just let a deflagration go, you get some sort of uh, velocity of that deflagration front. Okay, but if you calculate what the turbulence in this shell is doing at those small scales, the turbulence is moving faster than that deflagration speed. So it's called the distributed burning regime. Instead of just taking a laminar deflagration and kind of wrinkling a little bit, the turbulence actually penetrates through the flame, it mixes it, uh, it really broadens it out. It's called the distributed burning regime and it's thought, or at least rationalized, to lead to detonations. Okay. So this was the uh, motivation for why we have studied detonations in helium shells. Uh, actually, the sort of practical one is that detonations are way easier to model. All right, so you know, it's historical in a way, but um, because they're supersonic, because they're moving faster than the sound, the, pre, uh, the upstream fuel is frozen in. It doesn't know the detonation's coming. It's much easier to model. Okay, so deflagrations are harder to model, uh, and so the bulk of the studies that have been done have been about detonations. Okay, so this is an example of a spherically symmetric uh, helium shell detonation that we did uh, six years ago now. And you can see some of the hallmarks of a detonation in a helium shell. So, sorry, I should say this is a 0.2 solar mass helium shell initially on top of a, a 0.6 solar mass carbon oxygen core. Okay, detonation is moving out this way. And this is the, these are the burning products that result. So you burn up the alpha chain towards the peak. So you get things like chromium-48, which is interesting because it's radioactive also on days to weeks time scale, which is good for powering some sort of uh, thermonuclear light curve. You also get some nickel. Uh, you get iron-52, which is also radioactive, but it's radioactive on minutes. And so you actually, it's, you know, all that energy is dumped in and gone by the time you were to see it. Uh, and you also get an interesting amount of titanium-44, which is not radioactive on these time scales. Uh, but it's a uh, very effective uh, uh, line blanketing, and so you will see its, its effect in the spectra. Another interesting thing is you, uh, there's a fair amount of unburnt helium towards the surface because the densities are lower, and so the time scales for burning are longer, or the length scales are longer, and so you don't burn completely. But you still burn some of it. You still burn something like 50% of that stuff towards the iron peak. And as a result, you're releasing uh, nuclear energy throughout the envelope, it's something like 10 to the 18 ergs per gram for burning, burning helium. And that results in velocities of order of 10,000 kilometers a second. Okay. Let's contrast that to the deflagration case. Again, deflagrations are subsonic. They're less complete burning. There's time for pre-expansion. Okay. And you can see that in this case, there's only actually been one study that has looked at uh, helium shell deflagrations uh, in stellar models, and that was done by Stan and Dan a few years ago. Okay. Again, deflagrations tend to be harder, and so most people have been detonations. Um, but again, you see that deflagrations are less complete in their burning, so instead of producing a lot of nickel, you produce a little bit of nickel. Uh, you still get radioactive stuff, so that's good for powering a light curve, it's, except it's just less, you know, it's, high, it, it's not as high on the alpha chain, it's, it's chromium-48. Okay, and you also see the fact that you don't burn the entire envelope. There's a lot of unburnt helium, this is purely unburnt helium, because the deflagration fizzled because all this stuff went to low densities before the deflagration got to it. Okay, as a result, the velocities you get, uh, because you didn't burn as much material, there's less nuclear energy release, and so the ejective velocities tend to be lower. So instead of 10,000 kilometers a second, you get something like a few thousand kilometers a second for the bulk, for, for the line forming regions. Okay, uh, so I've got about 10 minutes, I think. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, except to say that uh, these have been generally spherically symmetric de detonation calculations, detonation or deflagration calculations. Life is not necessarily that easy, okay? It's never that easy. Um, it turns out that there are some complications that you have to throw in that are necessary if you want to get these uh, calculations right to produce the right observables. One of, them, one of them is including a large reaction network. You can't get away with a 19 isotope you know, alpha chain network because there are these, these uh, reactions that don't occur in regular stellar evolution, but do occur in unstable helium burning. So in particular, there are these funny proton-catalyzed alpha captures that allow you to burn helium much, much faster than uh, you would with just the triple alpha and, and, and other alpha capture reactions. Okay. So Sorry, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, you do also need to include multi-dimensional effects, uh, at least, you know, either directly or somehow include them in, in your 1D code. And that's because as the, uh, you know, these have been strictly symmetric calculations before, 
but these uh, burning waves are spreading across the surface of the white dwarf, and as they do so, the, they can expand off the surface of the white dwarf, and that expansion quenches burning. So you don't burn all the way up the alpha chain, instead you start you know, truncate burning halfway up the alpha chain or so. This has very large effects for, if you're trying to calculate whether you can start a detonation or deflagration, how that, def de you know, how that mode of burning propagates around the surface, whether or not the shell can actually support that flame. Uh, and so we've done some work on that, basically showing that um, the larger isotope, the larger reaction network more than offsets this radial effect. And so you can still propagate detonations and deflagrations in quite small envelope masses, as a matter of fact. Something like a few thousandth of a solar mass can still support a detonation. Okay, so that was a whirlwind uh, showing of our hydro models. So now that we have hydro models that tended to be in 1D and uh, not necessarily trustworthy, we're still going to you know, bravely forge ahead and do some radio transfer on these because we like to generate some observables, right? Okay. Uh, Dan talked about this yesterday. I just want to point out that if you're doing back of back the envelope order magnitude, the lifetime of a light curve is controlled by how much stuff you have to diffuse through and how fast the stuff is expanding because that, uh, you know, more diffuse is easier to diffuse through. Uh, so for higher ejective masses and lower ejective velocities, you get larger diffusion times. Here we have low ejective masses and high velocities, and so we tend to get diffusion times that are something like weeks instead of uh, you know, a month or so. Uh, let me also say that the deflagration case, because it didn't burn everything, it's lower velocities, so that actually counteracts the fact that there's lower ejective mass as well. So those aren't quite as rapidly evolving as you might otherwise expect. All right, so here are some uh, radio transfer for detonation models. Uh, ours is not the only study, so Stan and Dan also did one, as well as a few other people, and we all tend to agree, um, which I think that means either we're doing everything right or doing everything wrong. Um, but again, most of these have been one in, D, in 1D, and so not necessarily trustworthy, okay? But the basic idea is that, because they're low ejective masses, you get peaks that rise in something like a week, and again, because there's less stuff, there's less radioactivity, they're not, uh, they don't peak as bright as a regular type 1A would, for example. Uh, because more ejective mass, more uh, brighter, and also longer diffusion time, you get something like a Phillips relation, okay? So that you know, sort of jibes with your uh, naive intuition. Okay. The spectra, uh, the nucleosynthetic burning products are titanium and chromium and calcium. And so you get spectra that reflect that. So here is one model at different times showing you know, the titanium trough, calcium, uh, IR, and H and K. Um, here's a suite of them at near maximum light, basically showing uh, roughly the same stuff. Okay, there is some diversity depending on the burning products and uh, how, much the, you know, how much luminosity is coming out at a given time. But, um, right, but in terms of isotopes, what you're seeing is titanium, calcium, chromium generally. No silicon and sulfur usually because it's not produced. And in these models, no helium because uh, it was not excited in these models, and I'll get, to, um, I'll get to that in a second. For the deflagration case, as I mentioned before, so these are our dashed lines in Stan and Dan's work, they don't, rev uh, they don't evolve quite as rapidly as you might expect because the ejective velocities are lower. Okay, there's less radioactive, radioactivity produced, and so they're not quite as bright. Uh, and the lower ejective velocities are also reflected in the, narrow, the narrower lines. All right, so getting back to the question of helium excitation, in all these models, there's a ton of unburnt helium, so you might expect to see it. The problem is that uh, helium is being excited non-thermally, and so if you don't have that in the radio transfer code, you won't see it. To date, there's been one, uh, one time-dependent study looking at the effect of non-thermal helium excitation, done by Luc Dessart and, and Helier last year. Uh, what, they're showing, what they're showing is the effect of removing helium, so that's the red line, if you remove helium, uh, you get the red line versus the black line, which is including helium as well. And so in the optical, okay, there is this line here, but it's in the middle of a ton of titanium, which is the, the green line. Okay, so the titanium line blending really is starting to swamp through you know, the optical helium signature in this, in this particular case. The only strong helium signature they got was around the 11, you know, in the IR, around 11,000 angstroms. Okay, so at least for this particular case, it's suggesting that it's hard to do the helium line identification in the optical. You would have to go to the IR. Okay, okay so let me just, uh, starting to run out of time here, let me compare it to some obser observations, things that we were hoping would be 0.1a supernovae when they first came out historically, but I think don't actually fit the bill very well. So in 2010, there was 22, uh, 2002 BJ. 
Um, for various reasons that I think Maria will talk a bunch about, I don't think they actually work out as well. Even though they did see, it, it did seem to show signs of helium burning in some sense, they're actually too bright and, and too rapidly evolving. So I don't think that was a great fit. There's a class of calcium-rich oxygen-poor transients that also seem to show some sign of helium burning, which is very uh, nice. Okay, their light curves also tend to match with some 0.1a uh, predictions, which are in the dashed, I believe, okay, so they seem to fall in line, that's good. Um, however, oh, and sorry, and there's also another event, this Ogle event that um, in Sarah, Cosmo and Sarah led a paper on last year that also seems to fit photometrically nicely, also shows evidence of some sort of healing burning, in particular strong uh, titanium features. Okay, so that was nice. However, these uh, transients have this very strange property of being extremely offset from their host galaxies, so they're tens of kiloparsecs away. And when you really dig down deep into the location of these supernovae, there's really nothing there, because there isn't faint dwarf galaxies. So there's something very strange going on with this particular subset of supernovae, where, which seems to imply some sort of hypervelocity ejection scenario. And the binary, the binary scenarios I'm talking about have nothing to do with hypervelocity ejection. There's no reason to think that they would only occur via some ejection scenario. So I think something funnier is going on with these, these supernovae as well. Okay, so let me just try to summarize in the remaining, I think, four minutes, four-ish minutes I have in this uh, terribly ugly plot uh, table. I'm sorry, I apologize, but it, it was hard to get this information on one slide, so I did the best I could. Okay. Um, sort of laying out my bi very biased opinion on what I think are, what I think is happening in closed compact binaries involving helium mass transfer. So again, I agree with Wolfgang. Sorry, I should say these are the binary scenarios. Uh, and two different columns depending on whether or not you believe in the deflagration to detonation transition. So you start a deflagration in the distributed burning regime, does it become a detonation? Okay. I agree with Wolfgang that I think the bulk of type 1a supernovae, so type 1a supernovae, core car carbon detonation eventually, I, I think that the bulk of those come from a scenario where you have a double white dwarf binary, and you have a helium rich white dwarf unstably emerging with a carbon oxygen white dwarf that sets off the core detonation. So in that case, you get a shell detonation that sets off the core detonation. It's a double detonation, double white dwarf scenario. And I think that basically fits, in my opinion, most of the type 1a uh, supernova observational constraints. Okay. However, there is a scenario where what if you don't detonate that white dwarf? What if it's too low mass? Or what if it's an oxygen neon white dwarf? So you only get the shell detonation. So there's still some potential for 0.1a supernovae in these double white dwarf systems. Um, there's a little bit of caveat that uh, there's a question mark there because I think these shells are actually so small that you don't produce any radioactivity. So I think even in those cases, you might get an explosion, but we might ever, not ever see them. These are, are the non-degenerate helium burning star scenarios. So for a low mass helium burning star, it's a low accretion rate, you get large ignition masses, and you get shell deflagrations, definitely, that start. That's, those shell deflagrations will appear as 0.1a supernovae. They'll produce radioactivity. You'll see them on you know, days to week time scales. Okay, so those will produce 0.1a supernovae. If they instead transition to a detonation, okay, that can still yield a 0.1a supernova. However, there's a danger that now you set off the core. You also explode the core. And then historically, this was the original double detonation scenario for type 1as, but they got sort of thrown out because the, the helium shells, in this case, with this low mass helium burning star, the helium shells were so large that they adversely affected uh, your predictions for type 1a supernovae. So this would be something like a type 1ab supernova. I don't mean to you know, create another confusing nickname, but uh, it would be a 1a with helium burning signatures on top. All right. And finally, there is this case where you could get a high mass helium burning star, very rapid mass transfer, stable helium accretion onto a white dwarf. And if that white dwarf starts at a high mass, say 1.0, 1.1 solar masses, you can build it to the transverse Sacher mass. In which case, you'll start a carbon core deflagration, okay, just like in the Chandra Sekar mass type 1a standard scenario from the late 90s and 2000s. Okay, if that deflagration doesn't transition to a detonation, you get a very nice model for type 1ax supernovae, which we heard about yesterday. And I think it really fits a lot of the uh, observational constraints, including what the pre-explosion pre imaging should look like and the post-explosion imaging, et cetera. So that's a very nice model if the deflagration doesn't transition. If it does transition, you have the, exactly, this is the standard DDT delayed detonation type 1a scenario from the, from the late 90s, 2000s, and you get a regular type 1a uh, supernova. Personally, these days, uh, because of these two empirical things, I think that DDTs are not as favored as they uh, definitely used to be. So if you get a DDT in this scenario, you're going to have this funny looking type 1a, which we've never seen. So either they're extremely rare or they don't happen 
okay, because the DDT didn't occur. Uh, on the flip side, okay, if, you, if the DDT doesn't occur, you get these really nice explanations for type 1ax supernovae. So it sort of gets two things at once if you don't allow for that transition. Um, so even though a lot of work has been done to get the 1a scenario to work, I think it actually fits a lot more things if you don't allow it to work. Thanks. And, uh, and, uh, right. and there's still a large parameter space for these shell deflagrations of helium. Uh, let me just leave these, uh, let me just say really quick that a lot of future work needs to be done, especially in multi-D deflagrations and detonations, getting right predictions, uh, and then running them through radio transfer. And I'll just leave this up here as I finish. Thanks. Could you comment on event rates? Because in the original 0.1a model, the inferred event rate was pretty high. Right. And you've come up with even more pathways here. And yet observers can't find any that are, you would agree, are you know, 0.1as. So what does that imply that we're missing? That's a great question. OK, so as I was saying, I, the original 0.1a paper was talking about double white dwarf systems leading to these kinds of explosions. Now that I think they instably merge instead and produce type 1as, like regular type, type 1as, the rate comes down uh, a fair amount. So now we're mostly left with, with this scenario where you have a helium burning star uh, plus a white dwarf. Okay. Because of the way uh, the binary evolution work, works, these all come in at relatively young ages, so less than a giga year, say 100 mega years. Um, but the overall rates, I think, uh, are at least consistent with their non-detections. They're also fainter, um, and so that will impact them as well. So I, I don't think the rates are in, in uh, whatever the word is, disagreement. Um, but yeah, we need, to, we need to figure out better population synthesis predictions and also better observable predictions to actually get at the rate. Uh, so Ken, the uh, assertion that all of these double white dwarf binaries are unstable, I'm a little confused in the sense that we know of some double white, bi white dwarf binaries that are stable, these AM Cam Venn <laughs> systems. In fact, the period uh, for some of them is increasing with time. So we think that the accretion rate is actually decreasing. So could you maybe expand a bit upon your assertion? Uh, MCBNs, when they can infer a mass, they're extremely low mass. They're less than 0.1 solar masses. So most of them are, I think, a few hundredths of a solar mass, 0.05, say 0.04. So these are not, uh, you know, they would have had to, uh, to get there from a double white dwarf stage, they have to have gone through a mass transfer of, say, a few tenths of a solar mass. So the, the things we're seeing now are not typical double white dwarf binaries. They've definitely undergone a, a ton of mass uh, loss. And I think they're actually coming from either non-degenerate helium burning stars or from a sort of modified CV evolution with hydrogen mass transfer that uncovers a helium, helium core. So it's, uh, the rates are totally fine with none of the MCBNs coming from double white dwarf binaries. I have two questions, if I'm allowed. The, the first is no. uh, more ob observational. Uh, and so we know of something that's sort of similar. We have observations of a helium nova. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious where that fits into the story. Right. So I, I glossed over it. I think it was on a slide, maybe. OK. Helium novae um, are relatively quiescent. So they are just Eddington limited objects where the convective burning never becomes inefficient. So these are exactly like classical novae, just helium burning, where the convective ideas can carry away heat and you don't get the production of radioactive, you know, you don't burn all the way up the alpha chain. It's basically just helium burning to carbon and oxygen. Right. So, so sorry, and maybe, um, but you're, you're saying that that's a helium burning star with a CO primary. Uh, so you can do that in that scenario, yes. You can get helium novae in a binary where you have a helium burning star donating helium at the right rate to a white dwarf. Okay. And then the more theoretical question but is. Just, just to be clear, I'm not including that as a 0.1a. It doesn't sure. produce radioactivity. Right. You won't see that in another right. galaxy. Right. Or not a uh, so so the, the other question is um, can you comment on when you start polluting the helium that you're transferring with, say, CNO? Uh, yeah, so that was also in a slide that I skipped over. Um, so carbon and oxygen provide seed nuclei for alpha captures, and so allows a much faster helium burning than just straight triple alpha, which you might be used to from stellar evolution. So C and O help you burn helium. The presence of nitrogen is good because it uh, allows the production of protons, which catalyze these alpha captures. So if you want to get all this helium burning right, you have to make sure you're doing the right uh, trace abundances as well. 